west coast of Britain is one of the most dangerous coasts in the world. Far down in the treacherous waters of the Bristol Channel lie the remains of many long-forgotten ships that met their doom upon its murderous rocks and shallow sandbanks. Along this rugged and windswept coast, ships come and go, plying their trade in and out of busy ports and harbours, whilst many of the people who inhabit its shores earn their living from the sea. Between the coastal towns and villages, there are scattered bays with fine beaches, sand dunes, and headlands where seabirds find a haven amongst the crags and ledges of sheer cliff faces, plunging down to feed in the swirling, foaming cauldron below. Beyond land, there is only the vast Atlantic Ocean. These shores often lie in the path of high tides and strong gale force winds, and the sea is constantly changing. The light-hearted and virtuous sea, the enticingly capricious sea, the dark and tempestuous sea. The inhabitants who live beside it know it well. And in communities such as this one at Mumbles, on the southwestern tip of Swansea Bay, there is a lifeboat station. Today's lifeboat crew is no longer made up mainly of fishermen and their kind, as it used to be in days gone by, but there are always plenty of volunteers prepared to risk their lives in order to help save others. On this particular day, the lifeboat returned safely after rescuing a man injured in a ship far out in the channel. And as the lifeboat is put back in its boathouse, the crew check that all is well and clean and polish it in readiness for its next launch. Life in the village returns to normal. But every so often, a lifeboat is launched into the unknown for the last time, soon to be overtaken by tragedy. On the 23rd of April, 1947, the lifeboat Edward, Prince of Wales, which was stationed at Mumbles, went to the assistance of a merchant ship, the SS Sam Tampa, which was being blown ashore by a violent gale in the Bristol Channel, and both ship and lifeboat were wrecked. There were no survivors. The Sam Tampa was a 7,000-ton Liberty ship built in the United States during the Second World War under an agreement between the British and American governments. Many Liberty ships were to sail in the Atlantic convoys, supplying Britain with essential food and raw materials in the dark and perilous years of the war. Over 2,700 Liberty ships were built by shipyards in America, and to facilitate rapid construction, the major parts of each vessel were prefabricated and the various hull sections welded together. By the standards of the time, the Sam Tampa was a large vessel. The crew accommodation and machinery were situated amidships, and there were three cargo holds forward and two aft. The ships that sailed during the war were painted a drab grey colour to camouflage them against the sea and sky, and they carried defensive armament to protect them from attack. But even so, Many vessels were sunk by enemy action. For those Liberty ships that survived, there was the prospect of continuing to sail in peacetime. The shipping company Holder Brothers and Company Limited of London became the new owners of the Sam Tampa in April 1947. The Sam Tampa docked at Middlesbrough and Teesside in the northeast of England, where most of the crew were paid off. Before being officially handed over to the new owners, the Sam Tampa was to sail to Newport in Monmouthshire for a dry dock inspection. 
Fresh members of the crew were signed on at Middlesbrough, many of them local men. And in the early hours of the 19th of April, the Sam Tampa slipped from her mooring and left Middlesbrough docks bound for Newport in ballast. The voyage began uneventfully enough. Visibility along the east coast was poor, but the sea was calm. In the English Channel, the voyage was slowed down by headwinds, which, whilst moderate in strength, was sufficient to reduce its speed and delay the estimated time of arrival in Newport. At 10 o'clock in the morning of the 23rd of April, the Sam Tampa passed Hartland Point on the North Devonshire coast and was observed from the shore. The ship proceeded up the channel in rapidly worsening conditions, and when it drew near to Fallen Point, further along the coast of North Devon, the master decided to heave to rather than continue with the voyage. This would have meant that the Sam Tampa turned about to face into the strengthening southwesterly gale. As the afternoon wore on, the ship was carried across the channel by the wind and the tide, from the deep water in the middle of the channel towards the shallow depths of Swansea Bay on the coast of South Wales, where both anchors were put down in a desperate attempt to maintain its position. Around six o'clock in the evening, the Sam Tampa gave a bearing of 290 degrees, two and a half miles from Porthcawl Light. People on land saw the vessel, evidently in distress. A farmer working on his land close to Scare Point, a notorious ledge of rocks, watched for a few moments then hastened to the farmhouse from where he rang the coast guard. Operator, get me the coast guard please. Coast Guard Station Officer at Porthcawl, George Shepherd, received a report that a ship was near the shore, but the lookout tower was too far around the coast for the ship to be visible. He set off immediately in the direction of Scare Point. And when he arrived at a stretch of coast northwest of the town, he saw the Sam Tampa about a mile offshore, apparently stationary and at anchor. From where he stood, it appeared that there were traces of smoke coming from the ship's funnel and that the propeller was turning. He made his way to the Royal Porthcawl Golf Club nearby. And sent a message for the Mumbles lifeboat to stand by. Get me Mumbles, 8472, quickly. Twelve miles across Swansea Bay, the Maroons were fired and the Mumbles lifeboatmen quickly made their way to the boathouse where the lifeboat stood waiting. Edward, Prince of Wales, had been with the station since 1924. It was a 45-foot-long Watson-class motor lifeboat to which a small deck shelter was added in 1928 and it had no radio. It had a crew of eight men and the coxswain was William Gammon, 
who had already been awarded the gold medal of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution for conspicuous gallantry in October 1944. Now, knowing that the terrifying conditions outside the boathouse would make a rescue almost impossible, he chose the most experienced men available to go with him. The wind was southwest, blowing force six to eight at the slipway, where, sheltered by land, it would have appeared deceptively calm, and force eight to ten in the bay beyond. The lifeboat set off. Not long after its departure, it was forced to return to the slipway for more information on the position of the Samtampa, since none of the crew could read the signals flashed from the shore. But once the information was communicated verbally and borne to them upon the wind, the lifeboat headed seaward again. As it vanished into the gathering gloom, the coxswain and his crew were seen for the last time. At about the same time, the Samtampa's master, fearing that the anchor cables would not hold much longer, sent out an SOS signal. Soon afterwards, the starboard anchor came away. On land, the watching Coast Guard officer saw the ship begin to drift rapidly ashore, and he ordered the life-saving apparatus company to be called out. Hello, I need the LSA company immediately. Scare point. The men were summoned by the firing of the maroons. Now, dragging its port anchor cable and completely beyond control, the Sam Tampa struck the rocks at Scare Point which were mostly submerged by the exceptionally high tide. Local people gathered quickly along the shore to watch the ship, tearing itself against the jagged and unyielding rock, so close to the safety of land, with the members of the crew visible on deck. When the life-saving apparatus arrived, the Coast Guard company set up the rocket machine. The men made three attempts to fire rocket lines over the wreck, but each attempt failed. The ferocious gale, rising to force 10 and more, blew the rockets back onto land. Nobody could do anything except watch in horror and incredulity as the stranded ship broke up into three sections, splitting along its welded seams.
midsection heavily weighted with the engine, the bridge and crew accommodation where the men were massed together sank into the water. The lighter fore and aft sections were thrown up into the rocks to be pounded mercilessly by the crashing waves. Hundreds of tons of fuel oil from the ruptured ship lay on the surrounding sea, turning it into a dreadful trap for the 39 men of the Samtampa, for whom there was no escape. When darkness fell, car headlamps were switched on and pointed seaward, but nothing more could be done except wait. Gradually, the gale died down and the tide ebbed. With the coming of the cold grey dawn, a ghastly spectacle was revealed to the people on the shore. For the lifeboat lay capsized on the rocks about a quarter of a mile from the shipwreck. crew of eight men had also perished. When the population awoke in the morning, those whose homes lay in the line northeast of the wrecked Liberty ship discovered that their windows and walls were covered in black oil. During the hours that followed, on a calm and sunlit day, the grim job of recovering the bodies got underway, and the lifeboat wreckage was carefully examined by staff from the Royal National Lifeboat Institution and then it was set on fire in accordance with tradition in the lifeboat service. The eight lifeboatmen were buried in Oystermouth Cemetery, overlooking the village from where they came and the sea that they challenged. Of the 39 men of the Samtampa, 12 were buried in Porthcawl Cemetery and others were taken back to their own hometowns and villages elsewhere in Britain, many of them to the northeast of England around Middlesbrough. When a new lifeboat arrived in Mumbles, it was named William Gammon in honour of the coxswain and his crew and now it is preserved in Swansea's Maritime and Industrial Museum. As for the present day, ships continue to sail in the channel and the lifeboat service goes on. But no one knows when the fearful and terrifying violence of the sea will return again to disturb the peace and beauty of this dangerous coast. <laughs>